everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm thrilled that you can join us today. We're going to have a really interesting conversation today, talking with Kevin Dill, who has been living with Lewy body dementia since 2019. And he's going to be talking about the importance of thriving and feeling purposeful when you have the disease. Um, and, and really, all of us should want to live a purpose-filled life, bottom line. But before I introduce Kevin, I always like to do a couple of shout outs. And first, I want to shout out to the Mark Artisan Band. I'm so thankful for them for letting us use their music clarion call to open our show. And I always like to say hello to our new listeners. We get people all over the world at all ages and stages and physicians regarding dementia. You are welcome. Know that you could be our next guest as well. Everyone at every level is is welcome. Um, So just reach out to me if you think that you have a story to to tell. And that could be a personal story. It could be something business-related. Our goal here is really to raise everyone's voice and really talk about true things. You know, we want to give people sound information and connect them to services, products, and tools, not just talk about sound bites. Now, in addition, I want to point you, of course, to Alzheimer's Speaks website. We have one whole section that is just full of free educational resources. So please go there. You'll also find a tab on our site for a book. Betty the Bald Chicken has finally come to life. It's been a keynote of mine for years, and people have asked me to put that in book form. So really, it's a children's book. Um, But I think the kids are going to teach the adults a lot of lessons with that. We are going to go ahead and hear from Adaptive Equipment and Caregiving Corner, and then we will be right back with Kevin. I love the footbar walker, and let me tell you why. It is the option for my toolbox that I've been waiting for. Let's be honest. There are some clients who, despite our best rehab efforts, just aren't able to return to performing a sit-to-stand transfer on their own. Now I can offer my caregivers an easier, safer option that doesn't involve hoisting their loved one up from a sitting position. I don't recommend this walker for all of my clients, but I do recommend this walker for those caregivers looking for an easier, safer option with transfers. I would also encourage other therapists to add this walker to their toolbox. It's kind of like having my own mobile parallel bars for the client to pull up on. Whether it's a family caregiver at home helping a loved one with Parkinson's or dementia, CNAs in a long-term care facility assisting their patients, or therapists adapting to client and caregiver-specific needs, we now have a very safe and effective option to offer in the Footbar Walker. Check this product out at thefootbarwalker.com. That's it for today from Adaptive Equipment and Caregiving Corner. Have a great day, and don't forget, if you can't do it, adapt it. So it's time to introduce you to Kevin. Uh, Kevin Dill has been living with dementia, um, the Louis body type since 2019. And he is a proud military veteran, retired police officer, and director of Veterans Affairs. And we're going to have a really interesting conversation. We're going to cover a lot of different topics, and I know you're going to want to hear them all. Well, Kevin, I am so excited to have you on the show. We've been going back and forth um, since last year, trying to coordinate this. And if it wasn't uh, your side, my side, it was it was always something popping up. So I'm just thrilled to, to have you with us. You are such a prominent voice in the arena of Louis Body. And um, before we get into the line of questions that I have, I always like to ask everybody if they have other family members or friends that are dealing with dementia. Uh, Yeah, I've been told my uncle on my mother's side has Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's and my nephew, my dad's brother's son, he just passed away from 
Parkinson's and dementia. And I think I have another uncle with uh, Alzheimer's. And um, I think that's, I think that's it. That's quite a few. So for you, you know, living with Louie body, how did you get diagnosed? Can you share what some of the symptoms were? Yeah. Um, I was, it was mostly from my staff um, who began to notice changes in me at the office. Um, I was um, having trouble concentrating, uh, remembering things. I was considered an expert in my field and I was just struggling and always had to ask them questions. And, um, and then I was um, at times forgetting, you know, how to start my truck, how to get home. Um, I started wondering if uh, my staff was uh, not letting me go home. Um, I was beginning to lose um, my concept of time. Uh, if if I was at the office for eight hours, to me it felt like five minutes. Um, and so they called my wife and said, I think something's wrong with Kevin. And I, I think I thought I was just tired. Um, because I was, I worked a lot. Uh, I would get calls from different doctors and nurses from different hospitals all over Iowa, asking my opinion on patients, veterans. Um, but then when the hallucination started, um, that's when we thought, okay, something must be wrong. And then my sleep pattern was off and I was having pretty vivid movements and dreams in my sleep. So we went to the doctor and the local neurologist uh, said, I think you have uh, uh, something called Lewy body dementia after the PET scan showed um, some abnormalities and what you would see with someone with Alzheimer's. So then I went to the University of Iowa hospital and clinics to the neural cognitive clinic they have there with specialists and after more testing uh, the doctor said it's probably 80% Lewy body, 20% Alzheimer's. Uh, so uh, they've just been calling it Lewy body dementia since uh, 2019. Okay. How, how did you deal with that diagnosis? Uh, uh, denial, uh, sadness. Uh, wasn't sure what to make of it. I remember the first neurologist said, don't Google it. Whatever you do, don't Google it. Um, so did you? And, uh, I didn't. I think my wife did, or my daughter did, and told my wife, don't, don't Google it, don't read about it. Um, the doctor thought I should retire uh, because my job was – complex and I was struggling and um, so I retired early and um, yeah it was rough spent the first um, I think year in severe depression um, sad didn't know what to do uh, went from uh, so many people needing me and um, to now just sitting at home. Uh, so one day I got in my truck and turned it on and shut the garage door and thought about going to sleep. Um, uh, but uh, um, I thought about so many people I'd helped in my job to him prove their lives and so many that wanted to commit suicide at my desk that I thought, well, what am I doing? And uh, turned off the truck and got out and started becoming an advocate uh, to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves living with a dementia-related disease. Wow. Thank you for being so honest about that. I hear sure. that so many people, but they don't always want that to be public. But I think it's such a critical piece 
of how severe the depression can be when you get a diagnosis like this. And when your life is flipped upside down, I, I, I think it's, you know, I, I hate to say it, but I think it's kind of normal, you know, when, when things get tossed that mm-hmm. severely, um, people have those thoughts. And, and I think we have to be able to talk about those, those things um, honestly and openly. So um, kudos for your bravery on that. I really do appreciate oh, it. Oh, well, thank you. After that moment, uh, my wife took me out to Boston. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite actors was Robin Williams in Goodwill Hunting. So I went and sat on the bench in that movie where he sat. And I just, I thought there for a moment, I wonder what he was thinking or going through at that time and him developing Louis body dimension, taking a different approach. Um, um, I don't know. I just thought about him and I think about that to keep advocating. What's well, important and, and, you know, no matter who you are, those thoughts can cross your mind and, sure. and- as as family and friends, we have to, you know, have our eyes and ears open, but we also have to be, you know, given some direction on how to help deal with that. Yes. Uh, because it's it's not it's not something simple. And I'm sure your your family probably went through some depression and, and being scared of, you know, what's going to happen to the, not only to, to dad or my husband, um, but to the family as a whole. And yes and stuff so um did your did your wife or did your kids uh were they struggling with the diagnosis as well yeah and i think they still do uh they may not say it as much Mm -hmm. but i I, i'm sure they still do but we're you know we're a family of strong faith and that's really where i get my strength from Mm -hmm. you know we're imperfect people living in an imperfect world and we get weak at times, but uh, we we find our strength and our faith. So I think one of the misconceptions with any of the dementias is that it's a, a disease of one. And yeah. you know, it's a disease of not only the family, but all your circles of friends and things too, because, you know, how do, how do they deal with it? Did you have yeah. um, friends and colleagues that pulled away from you or did most people stick around? Um. Yeah, it was very lonely for a long time. Um, people didn't come around. Um, at the time, my wife traveled uh, for work all week, and uh, it was pretty lonely. Uh, people seemed to just kind of disappear from my life um, after I was diagnosed and retired. And uh, that's that's a sad time, um, very sad time for all of us living with, you know, dementia-related diseases that that um, that folks tend to now advert their eyes and turn and walk away instead of welcome you in and saying how can I help. Um, so yeah, it was it was a it was tough, and still today, um, many people I don't hear from anymore. Um, so, yeah, well, and you're a young guy too. When, do you remember how old you were when you got diagnosed? Uh, I know Tammy says I was in my early fifties, so I'm still in my fifties, I'm told. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, my mom lived with dementia for 30 years and she had symptoms starting in her mid fifties and she lived Six. Um, but she was misdiagnosed for the first um, 10 years. Doctor kept telling her, it was, it's her, your hormones, Dorothy. And she's like, this ain't my girlfriend's hormones. <laughs> it's something different, you know. Um, she knew something was off. But back then, you know, the, the doctors really didn't know much at all. And you know, it sounds like you really lucked out, you know, getting a doctor who knew what they were talking about. Well, we, we, pushed you know the first thing the doctors always say well you're just depressed it's in your head it's something else and um, it took my staff in the community um, to say no there's something wrong it's not Kevin's not depressed Mm -hmm. you know Kevin's not 
mentally ill. Kevin's not sad. There's something cognitively um, wrong. Um, but yeah, many, unfortunately, many people live undiagnosed with dementia because the doctors always want to say it's something else or and I asked the doctor once why do you do that he says well you know those other things are curable and we want to give people hope I said you know that's a dangerous thing to do because um, if you tell someone that it's just in their head then people around them will think well, you're just in your head, why don't you snap out of it? And it puts them in a great depression. You know, you think about Robin Williams. You know, would he, would he be alive today if his head wasn't filled with the wrong information? Um, and that's my fight with the medical community today is stop doing that. If, if you have all your information and you've ruled everything out, then just call it what it is and let's work on improving the quality of their life while they're here instead of feeding them bogus information to make you feel better as a doctor because it doesn't help the family. It can destroy families. Um, oh, yeah. I've had people where they've gotten divorced. You know, they were told they were going through a midlife crisis. I mean, all yes. different types of things. And it's like, oh, my gosh. And people have said, I never would have divorced my husband, if I would have known this, you know, I thought this was, sometimes they think it's purposeful, you know, what's happening and, and um, really sad. And I agree, doctors got to get over themselves. They're not the only one to be able to bring hope. And it's one of the things that irritates me probably the most, because I personally think um, if diagnosis was handled differently, and even if they don't have a cure, there are a lot of other support systems, and that's one of the reasons Dave Weidrich and I created Dementia Map, which mm -hmm. is a, um, it's a global platform with uh, like 150 different areas that you can search categories. No one's saying that they've got the answer, but they've got support, and there's a yeah. lot more support out there um, like DAA and Dementia Minds and Dementia Mentors and you know, all of the Lewy Body Association. I mean, there's so many things. And I know when my mom got diagnosed, we weren't even given the Alzheimer's Association. I mean, I kind of tripped over that by accident. And I just kept thinking, where are all the other families like us? Where are all the other resources there has to be? And the more I dug, the more I found. And I'm like, we've got to be able to get this stuff disseminated and the doctor's office would be the perfect place to do that. I mean, right now you're seeing, as you well know, police departments are getting educated and mm -hmm. um, you know, fire departments, cities as a whole, lots of businesses and why our doctors aren't getting educated on, you know, different resources because if they were given, I just think of, and I'll use dementia map as, as an example, but if they were given that, and they go there and they see all of these resources. Yeah, it might be overwhelming, but it's going to be overwhelming in a good way. Like there's hope, there's help, um, there's people that understand this. And I, you know, I would have given, you know, my, my right foot for something like that, you know, during, you know, when we were going through with my mom, because it does, it feels hopeless. And when you put a whole family at risk like that, you know, when they yeah. all don't feel hopeful, that's that can be a really, really dangerous situation. So I, I appreciate you, you talking about that. We were like you. We stumbled over the Alzheimer's Association ourselves. We were diagnosed, given the Aricept or Donazepil, and said, see, in a year, and said, well, what do we do now? And the doctor's office said, we don't know. Just come back in a year or six months. And we stumbled around and found it the same way. And I thought about that here in Iowa and, and around is it's 2000 and something. Um, and yet we're no better off than we really were when the Alzheimer's Association was created by a, a, a family years and years and years ago who started it to, for people like us in the future, 
but yet, yet now those organizations seem to have turned it to research more than anything. And you look on those organizations and the first thing you find is the person in charge is marketing. And I don't understand that. I, I mean, here we are all these years, like with your mom, you, all these years later, if she was diagnosed today, you would stumble into something again almost because the doctor's office won't partner with everyone. And it's hard to get all the information out. It has to start at the doctor's office. Um, so that's a fight we're doing here in Iowa too. Um, it uh, makes me sad. Yeah, I only know of, and I, I talk with people all around the world, um, and I don't talk to everybody, but I only know in the United States of one place, um, and that's in Colorado, where they make up packets, and it's uh, Dementia Together, it's a dementia-friendly community, and they partner with the Alzheimer's Associations and, and all the others, and they give the doctor's office a full packet of resources. So when anyone is diagnosed, they get a, they get a packet of resources and it's like why is that so difficult i know when we've approached like clinics and and um, hospitals and things like that i can get the doctors on board i can get the nurses i can get all the clinicians i can get the the director typically even and then it gets to the internet people and their tech people and they don't want to hook up because they're afraid of you know something yeah. there and then the legal beavers i mean they bite into it and go never never you know we'll get sued if they screw up and it's like bottom line you can vet everybody till you know until you're exhausted and two seconds later they can hire some goofball that's gonna yeah. get me in trouble that that's just how it is and you know there are phrases that people can use and, and organizations can use to protect themselves as well saying this is information, but we're not part of it, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, I really think if we're going to make a huge difference, we got to start at that first step of diagnosis. It, it only makes sense to me. I also want to introduce you all to QBlocks. They have been absolutely excellent to deal with. They have been in business for 18 years and they serve the globe. I can't say enough good things about this company. I've had a lot of bad experiences. I don't know about you with tech companies. They have made a very complicated process very easy and their staff is so kind, so polite, so respectful to work with. And you know, when I am frustrated and ready to pull my hair out, they just smile and tell me everything's going to be okay. And they really are just on top of the communication, which alleviates so much stress as an owner when you're dealing with tech issues. You can get a 10% discount. Visit them at QBlocks at C-U-E-B-L-O-C-K-S dot com. Or you can email them at let's talk at QBlocks.com. For that 10% discount, just put Lori, L-O-R-I, in the inquiry form. And again, I don't think you'll be disappointed. I surely haven't been. I, I can't rave enough about this company. And that's kind of rare these days. Yeah, I'm on, a, I'm on a team with the Iowa Department of Public Health and the CDC. And I told them, you know, we have to look at this like a baseball field. You know, when you're up to bat, that's the diagnosis. So what's the next step is getting them to first base, which is getting them the information on where to go next. It's not that hard, people. I really don't understand why it's this hard. Um, I was on a call with Mercy One Hospitals here in Iowa where we're going to try to create something. And I know in Iowa next week I, I'm on the Senate floor trying to get them to approve money to hire dementia care specialist here in Iowa, where if you're diagnosed at your neurologist, the dementia care specialist in that region where your doctor is will show up and get you started. But politics, you know, the Republicans say we don't have the money, but the Democrats do. It's just, it, it's a sad time. <laughs> it, it is. It's sad and it's frustrating. We're losing so, time. And yeah. we're putting we're putting people at jeopardy. 
a lot of families don't know that there's a difference between government agencies, profit and nonprofit too. Yeah. They don't always work well together. The government agencies and the nonprofit work together more so and, and anything profit kind of gets pushed to the side. But yes. there's a lot of um you know, small nonprofits or, or for profits like myself that aren't making much money, but they're having a big impact. And, yes. And it's foolish, not in my mind, to not all work together. Let us all do what yes. we're good at. And none of us are ever going to know everything that's out there because it's constantly changing. And if we're going to serve, it should be constantly changing. So I think it needs to be, you know, a broader outlook and really an outlook of you know, the greater good, which yes. isn't a, isn't a business concept that a lot of people <laughs> embrace there. For those of you that are just tuning in, we are lucky to be talking with Kevin Dill, who has been living with Lewy Body Dementia since 2019. And he just got through sharing with us about his symptoms and, and um, how that diagnosis has affected him. I next want to talk to you, Kevin, about the artwork that you do because oh sure um, you know a lot of people think oh if you've got dementia you know you there's so many things you can't do anymore and so first i want to ask you have you always done art or was that something you started after your diagnosis no it was after i never really liked arts and crafts but it was funny after the slowly body dementia you're you know as you know your brain you know, now I like foods I never liked before and have different tastes. And now I paint and I never paint. I had no desire, but at least I don't feel like I had any desire to ever paint before. I don't remember that. But yeah, I, I, my wife started me painting last Christmas for something to do to occupy my mind. And so I painted a picture and s posted it on Facebook to show that people living with dementia can still do things. And somebody said, can I buy that from you? And I said, well, if you want to, but uh, how about you just make it as a donation to uh, dementia organizations? And well, then that started the ball rolling. And now I've been painting and raising money through the, through the art. Wow. That's, that's fantastic. Now, do you do freehand or, or paint by number? Or No, it's, it's, it's paint by numbers. Um, I've taken a break since the last one because the Parkinsonism is getting worse and my hands mm -hmm. tremor a little bit more and they get really tired. But, uh, no, it's paint by numbers and a big lighted magnifying lamp. Uh-huh to help me see, but I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it now more uh, because people like them and want to donate money uh, um, to help. One of the things that I have found is a lot of people who um, are living with dementia, and I've learned this through the interviews that we've done with people, say exactly what you're saying. You know, I, I did this, but now I'm having trouble with that. And they talk about how they adapt. And many of them change the types of art that they do. And uh, many of them right now are doing things online, you know, electronic art and stuff, which I find fascinating too. Oh. And so they're not as worried about the detail. They can do larger brush strokes and, and you know, be able to manipulate things. And I know um, Barry Libby does a lot of electronic. Uh, True, Truth of Loving Kindness does a lot of electronic and stuff. And uh, both of them are members of Dementia Action Alliance and or Arts and Dementia Group, I should say. And so it's it's just kind of fascinating to to see and how open they are with sharing with people of well, I used to do this, but now I do that. Or or Harry Urban, who used to do woodworking with a lathe, and that got too dangerous. He had a big one in the garage. Then his wife got him a smaller one, and then she said, nope, we got to get rid of the lathe altogether. And then he bought a 3D printer. And now he's creating things on a 3D printer, but we've got, you know, photographers and jewelry and um, woodworking, all kinds of, of different art that's just absolutely incredible. What do you get out of doing the art yourself? I, I like um, 
you know, I can see all the colors mm -hmm. and I like to see the colors become a picture. Mm -hmm. And I like to see the picture. Uh, it's weird because I don't really conceptually understand um, the picture. Um, but I just put the colors on the canvas and it creates a picture. And so I look forward to seeing what that picture will look like, even though I can see it. Well, I'm an example while I'm painting, my brain doesn't realize that. And so I paint and I usually don't stop until I get too tired. My wife makes me stop because I want to see what that picture is because I don't know what it is. Um, and so to me, I enjoy that. And my doctor, a neurologist, said that she can't explain how I can paint in my condition. And I thought, well, that's funny because there are so many people with Lewy body dementia and dementia related diseases who paint. Yep. Yeah. They many paint. And I, I thought, well, that's, it made me think how much doctors maybe really don't listen or interact more than they should to realize that many of their patients still involve themselves. I thought that was a strange comment, but I do enjoy seeing the picture come to life and then uh, people getting excited about it. Yeah. I Well, I think one of the things that they forget about is, you know, most of us don't, who aren't active in art, don't, don't do it one because of time, but probably a lot because we were told when we were younger, we weren't good at it, you know, yeah. or people were judging us. And a lot of times people say with dementia, they don't worry about that stuff so much anymore. And they get so, uh, they're so concentrated on what they're doing. It just gives them this great peace and calmness. Yes. And so like with you, where you said your, your wife's kind of got to go, Kevin, come on, it's time to go to bed. <laughs> you know, kind of drag you away. That's a real common thing that I hear from so many people because they're so zoned in and so yeah. calm and comfortable. And, you know, the more calm and comfortable somebody is, typically the less symptoms they'll end up having um, is something that I've been told by many people as well. And, okay. Yeah, I listen to uh, music to call me while I'm pain. And yes, my vision has changed to where it really only sees rights focused in front of me and I can't multitask. And so when you give me that painting project, I'm focused on that until I finish mm -hmm. or until someone has to drag me away or my hands just hurt so bad. And I don't understand, um, she says, you've been sitting out there painting for a few hours. But like I said, I don't understand the concept of time anymore. So in my brain, I just sat down five minutes ago. What do you mean I have to stop? Mm -hmm. She says, no, you've been at it for a very long time. And I, I know I will argue with her, but then she'll make me stop. So. <laughs> Well, and like you said, you, you know, you lose that ability to, to tell time, you know, mm -hmm. and how much has passed. And, you know, there's, there's some pluses and minuses to that, you know, when your hands yeah. are and things, but, but to be able to be that present is sure. a really, is really a gift too. And to have people come up to you and say, Hey, I want to buy your art. Uh, that doesn't happen to everybody every day. So that's yeah. that's pretty cool. I would love to see the art of people with dementia being displayed much more and even go on exhibit. I think I think people would be shocked. And I think it would be a way to help um, overcome a lot of stigmas that are out there as well. You know. Yeah, I think you bring up a good idea that I've never thought of. I, I, I guess I need to find an art person, a museum to see if we can do that. Um, that's a good idea. I, well, I'll have even to. In, even in a doctor's um, office. In their oh, country, sure. You know, a neurologist, that would be a fabulous way to, to give hope to people, you know, to, to exhibit things like that. The problem that I find is that a lot of them go, okay, you know, we'll frame it and ship it. And people don't have the money to go to all that expense to you yeah. know and so someone really needs to you know this has to be um a project that's funded and not having all that responsibility put on somebody with dementia yeah tammy told me a lady in alaska 
uh, bought one of my paintings in uh, it cost several hundred dollars to ship it to her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah it, it isn't a cheap route to go. Unless you're sending it not framed, and then they go and frame it once they're there, you know, and put yeah, it in, in a tube. Might be another another way around that, but a lot of times people want it, you know, yeah. set and ready to go when they get to it, but then it's going to cost them a little bit more on that. So. Yeah, it's not it's not a cheap thing. And then when it's exhibited, you need someone who actually knows how to exhibit art in the right light and and, yeah. and securing things well and and stuff. But I think hospitals or clinics would be you know a wonderful place to be able to do that. That's a good idea. You know, churches, um, yeah, you know, coffee shops really doesn't make anywhere any difference. We just have to get it up, even in senior communities a lot of times um, or memory care you know they they pay good money for the art on their walls and why they're oh. not why they're not utilizing and producing um and exhibiting what people are producing on their own campus to me is silly you know you buy the frames once and you can still rotate them out yeah true Thank that's you. my two cents on that anything that you would say to another person who, who's diagnosed with a form of dementia who hasn't done art to encourage them yeah i i think i always go back to when i'm feeling you know lewy body dementia causes severe depression um but the the vivid colors um, uh, can really brighten your day and make you feel like you still matter and you can still contribute and provide something that makes somebody smile. And the paintings that I do make people smile and they make me smile. Um, and uh, it makes you feel good about yourself again. Uh, so that's what I would say to them. Yeah, nothing to lose. No. Let's switch gears. I want I want to talk about some of the fundraising you do for Louis Body. Okay. Sure. Now you mentioned to me offline that you just got T-shirts in. So what are the T-shirts for? Well, these T-shirts this year are for uh, last year, and this is our second year. We partnered with Dillard's. Mm -hmm. uh, Dillard's is a department store. Um, mainly uh, Iowa, then south of Iowa to the East Coast. I don't think there's anybody, any really up north. Um, my wife worked for Dillard's for a long time, but we partnered with Dillard's and Kendra Scott Jewelry and the Louis Body Dementia Association. And what happens is we create these T-shirts. You can buy a T-shirt. Money from the T-shirt goes to the Louis Body Dementia Association. And then on February, in February, um, if you buy Kendra Scott jewelry at Dillard's, Kendra Scott donates a percentage of her sales to the Louis Body Dementia Association. So okay. we're doing that this year here in, in February. Uh, and that usually kicks off our fundraising events we do throughout the year is we start with that one. And for Kendra Scott Jewelry, they go to her website for that. That's not through Dillard's. That's a whole different. I mean, they're they're part. No, of it's through. It's only through Dillard's. Only through Dillard's. So okay, so yeah. buy Kendra Scott Jewelry through Dillard's. Okay. Yes. Okay. And well, you can call any Dillard's store mm -hmm. in the country and say, "I want to buy Kendra Scott Jewelry and have that for the Louis Body Dementia Association." So. Okay, well that's that's really cool. You also are doing some other things. Um, you have done like a 5K run um, in yeah. the past. Are you going to be doing another one of those this year? Yeah, we're we're talking about it right now. Our next event is the second annual Kevin Dill Golf Tournament for Dementia and Veterans. Uh, that's May 19th and 20th in Waterloo, Iowa, um, and so. Uh, it's a two-day event. Uh, May nineteenth, Friday is a is an evening event with food and music and events at the driving range to just get people excited. 
And then on the next morning on Saturday is the four person best shot. Um, and all that money, all 100% of the money goes to Dementia Friendly Iowa and two veterans organizations here in Iowa um, and to uh, Adaptive Golf Iowa. After I was diagnosed with Lewy Body Dementia, the Lewy Body Dementia Association suggested golf and I never played golf. And now I'm actually really good at golf, but I started playing golf. Uh, but then I was falling down on the course from the Parkinsonism. And so uh, there was this adaptive golf from Adaptive Golf Iowa that helped me to keep playing. And so I support them. Um, and so we'll have that event. And then, yeah, we had a 5K where my friend Jay Allen from The Voice came to sing. And we raised a lot of money. The 5K people were surprised at how many people showed up. Um, because they said 5Ks really aren't a big thing anymore, but we had a lot of people, and people are asking if we'll do it again. I just got a message from Morgan Miles, who I think she was a runner-up on The Voice this year. She just sent me a message that because uh, I asked her if she could come perform for that, and so we're looking at her coming to perform. Cool. Well, talk about big names. I I saw, what was it? I was on, I think, YouTube, and I saw uh, Jay Allen talking about how much money he's raised yeah. for, for dementia, and it's actually been incredible. Um, but his mom also had uh, early onset. Yeah, I grew up with his mother. Oh, okay, okay. Wow, yeah. small world, small yeah. world. Yeah. Gosh. Um, what other types of things does Dementia Friendly Iowa do? I, I believe they do like Dementia Friends education and stuff too. Yeah, so what Dementia Friendly Iowa does is they they go around to communities and give trainings to businesses like banks and stores, hair salon, anyone who's willing to go through training on how to be more friendly with people with dementia when they enter your business. And then they do trainings to uh, people that want to be dementia friends, just learning more about how to be more dementia friendly. To, you know, like I said, when you meet somebody with dementia or Alzheimer's or Lewy body or front temporal dementia or anything, that we stop adverting our eyes and walking away, that we walk with them and welcome them into the community. And so Dementia Friendly Iowa is trying to educate the state of Iowa, like many dementia friendly states, um, trying to educate their communities on um, how to be more friendly toward people with dementia. It's exciting to see all the different communities that are out there. I was involved with uh, the Lutheran um, home Association. We launched the very first dementia-friendly community in the U.S. in Wisconsin, and mm -hmm. you know, everybody wanted to know, you know, how are you doing this? How are you doing this? It's like just get started. Stop making it yeah. so complicated. You know, yes. use the resources you have. Attract people who are passionate about making a difference, and you'll be amazed at how fast the word will spread and the work that you can do. Um, yeah, the, the mayor of our city in Waterloo had approached me on my diagnosis and said, would you help form a committee to make our city more dementia friendly? And we did that through the Northeast Iowa Area Agency on Aging, and it went from just dementia friendly Waterloo. We did such a good job that the state of Iowa said, hey, can you can you guys do that and make it dementia friendly Iowa? And so um, that's what we're doing. I mean, they were the biggest, it's been the biggest help for so many people. Um, oh, it's huge. It's absolutely yeah. huge. I don't know if they do this here, because again, I, I haven't heard any other city other than our, our Roseville, Minnesota group. Um, the city has actually given us a space on their official page for uh, Roseville Alzheimer's and Dementia um, Community Action Group. And so we list the, all the programs, plus there's a, a lot of different kind of static information or past information that's on there. Wealth 
wealth of information. And we were told over and over it couldn't be done, but to actually for the city to give space to that says, you know, has a large statement and it makes it easier for people to be able to find the information that they're looking for. And well, more cities to do that. My big focus now is, you know, we have lots of information out there. We've had lots of information for 30, 40 years, really. Now it's how do, how do people help people like us or your mom navigate those resources instead of just handing it to them and saying, good luck. Yep. It's okay. We're not going to just hand this to you. We're going to sit down at your kitchen table and help you navigate it mm -hmm. uh, because you can give my wife a resource guide or a pamphlet and it's going to end up on the table under everything else because she's too busy trying to take care of me and everything else. And I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so I have found that that's what we're doing today. And I think we need to look at it differently and say, okay, we have all this education. Why aren't we getting better? Well, it's because the education is sitting there, but the caregiver and the person living with the disease don't know how, don't have time to navigate it. And sometimes the information is very complicated and too much information and you don't know how to get through all that stuff. And so my big fight is, okay, Alzheimer's Association and Lewy Body Dementia Association and all these organizations, all of you have your own resource guides and pamphlets and just a minutia of stuff. But has there been any return on your investment? Are we a better country and community on dealing with people with dementia and helping them? Uh, no, we haven't really gotten much better with all of your money and resources. So how about we do something different? And like we talked about, when somebody is diagnosed, there's somebody who shows up at their house or at that office, doctor's office, and says, you're not alone. Let me take your hand, and we are going to walk you to these resources, show you how to navigate them, and we are a person and a phone call away at any time to help you. Um, because I have met so many people that have raised their hand and said, here I am, choose me. I will do that, mm -hmm. but it takes funding. Uh, so now we're fighting with Congress, but you know, Congress, they'll say, well, we funded the Alzheimer's association. You know, we're doing something. No, that's, do you even understand what you're funding? You know, there's a new drug that's come out that, you know, you can't even buy, but yet doctors won't even prescribe it because of the side effects of it. So we, scream and holler and say, look, we funded all this money and we have a new drug out. Oh, give more money to us. Well, nobody's going to take that drug because of the side effects. The last one that came out, my doctor said, I'm not giving you that. I, you're not going to have brain bleed in my watch. Mm -hmm. So we need to take some of that money for research and put it into something else to improve the quality of lives of the people living with the disease today. Um, totally and we don't do that very well. No. And, you know, overseas, they do it all the time. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, the, the government has sectors over in Europe where, I mean, they have prime ministers that are in charge of dementia. And I mean, that's what they do. Wow. They get boots on the ground. Um, it's very, very different. And, it's, you know, they say how helpful that is, because like you said, it's it's this mire of information once you find it, if you can even find it, um, to to try to figure out what's going to work best for you. And um, yeah, something that definitely needs to be to be worked on. Again, for those of you, if you're just tuning in right now, we're talking with Kevin Dill. We have been talking everything from symptoms when he got diagnosed to um, the Lewy Body Association. Uh, Dementia Friendly Iowa, uh, Jay Allen, who has helped him with his fundraising as well, and then also art and dementia. Uh, so it's been really uh, an interesting, interesting conversation. I do want to ask you 
because I know you've got strong feelings about failure to thrive. And oh, yeah. why don't you tell our audience what you mean by that and why it's so important to you? Well, I know that a large percentage of people with dementia related diseases pass away from a failure to thrive. And I was, I've been feeling like that and I didn't quite understand it until we did some reading on it. And I realized, well, that's kind of what I'm going through. Even though my doctor says that's you're too early for that. And I said, well, I feel it. And I wonder how many others feel it where you're just, your brain kind of in layman's terms gets tired and doesn't you know you don't want to eat and you don't want to drink and you just lay there um your brain gets too tired to think it it doesn't it would rather just stare at the wall and you just kind of give up and i thought wow let's try to change that you know we just had a meeting with palliative care and it was a nice meeting, but I thought, why didn't you start this at diagnosis? Why weren't you talking to me about improving the quality of my life at diagnosis? Why did you wait so long? And that's just how the medical field works. And I said, well, that's backwards. <laughs> um, why don't we start with someone sitting with the family on how do we improve Kevin's quality of life? Why did you wait so long to where? Um, and so I, I, we don't talk about that enough. Uh, we don't, um, uh, I know there are many people like me out there with these diseases who are feeling that way and don't know how to communicate it or, uh, so how about we find those people, I mean, through doctors and through every other way and say, hey, we're here. How can we help? How do we improve the quality of your life while you're here today? Um, which always leads back to, I know research is important, um, but I don't think we're ever going to find a cure. Uh, and the medication that's come out has not worked. Uh, nothing. We're still all on the same medication that people were on 30 years ago. Um, so let's fund it a different way. Leave some for research and education, but let's get some money funneled in the way that the family who started the Alzheimer's Association wanted it funded to improve the quality of life of people living with dementia and to help caregivers to support them and be able to do that. Uh, I, I hope someday we can get back to what the spirit of the Alzheimer's Association was meant to be. Well, and again, you know, a cure, I mean, we all want a cure, but sure. if, you know, dementia is like cancer. There's, there's going to be all different types of cocktails that are going to be needed because the symptoms are all different. Plus they can, they can change, you know, from sure. one to another and, you know, some people like you are, are oh, oh, gosh, I won the lottery. I not only have Louie body, but I've got some Parkinson's disease here, too. I mean, I you know when my mom died upon autopsy, they found Alzheimer's disease was her primary, but Louie body and Parkinson's as well. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it, it, it attacks everybody a little bit differently. And, you know, one thing isn't going to fix it all but man there's a lot of ways we can give people comfort and quality of life sure. feel purposeful and uh you know while living with the disease kevin this has just been such a great conversation i appreciate you so much for all you're doing and your advocacy your voice is is really needed and appreciated um by so many of us uh in the industry because you know we need to hear we need to hear those voices of, of people living with a diagnosis. Um, well, one thing, I, one thing I always say here at the end is, I say it a lot, is, yes, I appreciate everyone out there who's standing on the mountaintops screaming for, for more money for research and education and screaming for us, but sometimes you need to come down into the valley and spend time with us and listen to us before you go back up on the mountaintop. 
because sometimes you're screaming from the mountaintop for the wrong things because you haven't been down in the valley in a long time. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a perfect way to sum it up. That's, you know, when I started Alzheimer's Speaks, that's exactly, you know, was my thought too. I'm like, I'm not aligning with anything out there because I don't want to get sucked into the big machine and become something that I didn't feel was serving um, yeah. as well as we could be. And I wanted to, you know, create something that was open for all people, all voices. Yes. Because I don't think we can be sustainable if we don't hear from, you know, those diagnosed from family members and, and the combination of everyone else in the world, you know, we can all support things in a different fashion. We can become much more creative when we open up that door. And, uh, and I think we can give a lot more hope, which then to me, people, I know we've always funded through fear, but I really think people will, will um, donate for hope as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think if we could do one other thing is, you know, the African-American community suffers greatly from dementia-related diseases, probably more than any other uh, person, but they tend to stay more private about it. And, and I, I don't like that there are resources and help out there, um, but they are tend, tend to be left aside because our national organizations, uh, you know, they just scream for money. And um, there are people suffering in the African-American community with dementia-related diseases that are suffering by themselves and in silence because we haven't welcomed them in like we should have uh, a long time ago. And so I kind of been speaking about that too. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different cultures that have kind of... Yeah. Un, been underserved, but they are definitely one of the top ones. But um, the Asian yeah. Pacific, um, you've got the Indians. There, there's so many, so many that uh, we we need a broader a broader net to scoop people up. But we also have to give them a reason to trust. Yes, that our motives are good. And yes, there's a lot of distrust out there, which, yes. which we all understand. So yeah. again, Kevin, what a wonderful conversation. Um, again, we've been talking with Kevin Dill, who's been living with dementia since 2019, and is truly making a difference on so many different levels. Uh, we will give you the information to, to contact Kevin um, through Facebook. And there's a lot of Kevin Dills out there, but you look for the the guy with the biggest smile and the yeah. widest, uh, widest blue eyes, and you will find him in a heartbeat. He's also on Instagram as Kevin Michael Dill. You can also reach him through Dementia Friendly Iowa at DementiaFriendlyIowa.org. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll, we're going to share on our, our blog and the radio show will have a link to a YouTube video that just shows the, the 2022 uh, 5k run. Oh, okay. And what, what that's all about. And we'll also hook you up on how to go ahead and get those t-shirts and Kevin, is it okay to give out your email address or not? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Sure. So Kevin's email is Kevin dot dill 1118 gmail.com and wrapping up here again i just hope you all like click and share this conversation so many people out there dealing with dementia that we don't even know are dealing with yeah. because they're not comfortable so we have to share this information more uh, let them know that there's hope there's new ways and there are people really pushing for better ways not only just for treatment but just to be able to live well with this disease and there's yes, a lot more support than than people will ever think is possible. We just have to get it all in one space. So yes. Um, so I would encourage people again to like, click, and share, and feel free to go to alzheimerspeaks.com. There we have one whole page that's just dedicated to a variety of free resources there, and um, you can always check out dementiamap.com which not only has resources that you can search, but it also has a calendar of events. Those terms we don't know when dementia hits us. Um, we'll give you a little guidance there. And there's a wonderful blog with lots of articles as well. Again, thanks everybody and have a blessed week. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hey everybody, Jared Sebesti, your host of Retire Repurposed. This podcast is dedicated to help people transition into fulfilling and purposeful retirements. Retirement is a big life change. In fact, the two most dangerous years of a person's life are the year they were born and the year they retire. Few people could just flip the switch from working a career 30 or 40 plus years retiring on Friday without methodical steps to living what we call a repurposed retirement. To listen now, search Retire Repurposed on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.